Hello, my name is Willem. I am the host of the History of Cologne podcast. Cologne is a city in today's western Germany. It is over 2000 years old and famous for its gothic cathedral. This old city on the Rhine River has endured a colorful and rich past. Hence it is full of events and narrations that represent European history as a microcosm. If you wondered, hmm, he sounds funny, yes I am a German and Cologne is my home city. I'd love to discover the story of my home city with you. After two years of producing, we've just left the Roman era behind us, approaching the early Middle Ages. So there's still so much to tell. Take a listen. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't cost a thing. I'd love to hear from you sometime in the History of Cologne podcast. Until then, auf Wiedersehen. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 22, A Cousin's Quarrel. Before we get started, I'd like to note that this episode marks the one-year anniversary of Grand Dukes of the West. Coincidentally, we also reached the 20,000 download mark a few days ago. From the bottom of my heart, Thank you to all of you who listen, and an extra thanks to anyone who's recommended the show to another. I hope that you will all keep listening and sharing the show, and if it's not too much trouble, I'd really appreciate any reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your app of choice. Hopefully by next year we'll have reached a new milestone in downloads. I have one in mind, but I'm too superstitious to put it out there. Now that that's out of the way. Last time we saw how John the Fearless and his brothers succeeded in Philip's lands. And now we'll see how John will vie for his father's old position in Paris. But before we can see how John fought to regain the Burgundian position at court, we need to see how that position fell apart in the wake of Philip the Bold's death. Philip the Bold was a senior statesman who had spent most of his life closely tied to the royal family, his family, and who had dominated the French court for two decades. On the other hand, John the Fearless was simply one cousin of a king who had many, he wasn't an outsider in Paris, but had not spent nearly as much time plugged into the affairs of the royal court as his father had at his age or as Louis of Orléans had. We saw that while Philip had gone to great lengths to secure his succession, the continuation of his dynasty, and the expansion of Burgundian power, he had not done quite as much to directly prepare his heirs for Parisian politics. I don't want to give you the impression that John the Fearless was untested, by 1404, he had spent years acting as his father's representative in Dijon, and so had become acquainted with administration and governance. And while the Nicopolis Crusade ended poorly, the Duke had learned important lessons from it. However, John's time in Paris was limited, and his connections at the capital were too. It's possible that Philip thought he had more time to incorporate his son into the political scene of the capital. After all, he was cut down by a sudden onset of the flu. But regardless, his position in Paris was quickly taken up by Louis of Orléans, rather than by his own son. As soon as Louis heard about his uncle's death, he got to work reinforcing his control over the royal council. Burgundian partisans were purged and replaced with Orléanists, and royal gifts earmarked for Burgundy were reassigned. Within weeks of Philip the Bold's death, the Duke of Orléans had remade the royal government to suit his interests. Shortly before Philip's death, a new tie, or land tax, had been collected for the purpose of funding attacks against the English in Guienne and Calais, and possibly for an invasion of England itself. The tax was unpopular with the people, but justified by the renewed tensions across the Channel. However, in the months following Philip the Bold's death, most of these funds disappeared into the pockets of Louis of Orléans. Louis did have his eyes set on expansion into Guienne, however. He controlled the neighboring territories of Angoulême and Perigord, and had cultivated alliances with the other major figures of the southwest, the Lord of Albret and the Counts of Armagnac and Foix. So what remained of the 1404 tie was directed southwards towards the war effort. But in the end, there would be no major military action taken against the English for the rest of 1404. There were small-scale battles and campaigns in Guienne, but Calais and England were off the table. The misappropriation of much of the 1404 tie was deeply unpopular with the people of France, and the fact that no major victories came from the rest of it simply poured more salt into the wound. Still though, these rumblings were not enough to threaten Louis's position of power. As the only brother of the king, 
He was the adult closest to the throne, apart from Charles himself. But at this point, King Charles is beginning to become an afterthought. Louis viewed his power over the king and the kingdom as natural and right, and much of the rest of the nobility of France agreed. This position can be seen in an early 1405 agreement that John signed with the queen. This agreement used to be seen as an alliance. After all, Isabeau had been a collaborator with his father. But the modern consensus actually goes the other way. While the queen did pledge to support John's interests, she only did so as long as those interests did not conflict with her own and the interests of those more closely related to her. Of course, as her brother-in-law, Louis' interests thus ranked above John's and the Queen's considerations. Which brings me to one of the most salacious bits of gossip in this period, that Louis of Orléans and Queen Isabeau were lovers. I feel like this needs to be brought up, because a large portion of histories on this time and place take it as fact, but honestly, I'm not convinced. It's absolutely possible that Queen and Duke were lovers, but there's no contemporary evidence for it. The coming conflict saw both Orleanist and Burgundian propaganda circulated throughout Paris, and both Isabeau and Louis had fairly negative reputations at the time. The fact that the earliest mention of an affair dates to 1419, years after Louis's death, makes me seriously doubt the fact that one took place. The Queen and Orléans were certainly political allies, but if there were even whispers of an affair between the two circulating during this time, I have no doubt that John the Fearless would have magnified those rumors in order to attack Louis. As he did not, I feel comfortable asserting that Isabeau and Louis were partners in the royal council, but not in the bedchamber. So when did the Queen and the Duke of Orléans become allies? Every time I've brought up the Queen thus far, she's been at best neutral towards the Duke of Orléans, and more often than not an opponent of his. But the obvious answer is the correct one. Upon the death of Philip the Bold, Isabeau joined the Orléanist camp. The reason for this can be traced to a few things. First, as I brought up earlier, Louis was simply closer to the royal family than John was. Second, the queen's position of power was mostly an indirect one. She was given the authority to arbitrate between the princes and the guardianship of her children, but she had no seat on the royal council. Therefore, the queen needed allies to look after her interests. And with Philip the Bold gone, Louis of Orléans was the most powerful one she could find. However, it would also be incorrect to see the queen as a staunch Orléanist. She looked after the Duke of Orléans' interests as long as those lined up with hers, and over the next few years she would waver between the Burgundian and Orléanist camps, as well as occasionally taking up a third, moderating position alongside the Dukes of Berry, Bourbon, and Anjou. And these dukes, too, towed a similar line to the queen. While Berry had often supported his brother Philip the Bold, Bourbon and Anjou had generally stayed neutral in the earlier conflicts. But with Philip the Bold gone, these princes of the blood began to line up behind Louis of Orléans as the natural leader of France. John of Berry did have a claim to be the senior statesman of the realm, but he was never a forceful or ambitious enough man to stake his claim over that of first Philip the Bold and then Louis of Orléans. But once more, Berry, Bourbon, and Anjou were not staunch Orléanists. In general, they would support the Duke of Orléans above the Duke of Burgundy, but that was due to Orléans' higher rank, more than a fierce sense of loyalty. And so when John first arrived in Paris as the Duke of Burgundy in August 1404, he found himself without much of the power that his father had enjoyed. However, he could celebrate the fact that his family was about to be closely tied into the royal family, ensuring that Burgundian influence would be strong in the next generation. John had come to Paris to celebrate the double wedding of his son and heir Philip to the Princess Michelle and his daughter Margaret to the Dauphin, Louis of Guienne. This wedding had been arranged by Philip the Bold in 1403, and while Louis of Orléans had tried to replace the Burgundian bride and groom with his own children, this had failed and the wedding was set to proceed. But don't feel too bad for Louis, as he did secure a royal bride for his eldest son Charles. King Charles agreed to marry his oldest daughter, the Dowager Queen of England, Isabella, to Charles of Orléans in 1406. And to one-up John, Louis had secured a dowry of 300,000 francs, compared to Michel's dowry of 120,000. Mind you, still a huge sum. And so despite John's children's entrance into the royal family, he was still being outmaneuvered by Louis. While John had been officially granted some of the pensions that his father had collected, these pensions would not be paid and neither were the almost 200,000 francs that the crown owed Philip the Bold upon his death. But perhaps just as worrying as the lack of cash flow, which was a major threat to John's solvency, by the way, 
was Louis's assumption of the office of Captain General for Normandy and Picardy. This office, previously held by the Count of Saint-Paul until his unsuccessful attack on Marc, gave Louis control over the French army in much of the north of France, including over several territories held by John. And to add insult to injury, after the English reprisals against Flanders, John had petitioned the royal government for funds to finance another campaign against Calais, but these funds were withheld and no campaign would be authorized. But the Captain Generalcy was not Louis's only means of encircling John the Fearless. Orléans had already acquired the Duchy of Luxembourg and the counties of Vertu and Soissons in Champagne, which blocked the routes between Flanders and the two Burgundies, and Flanders and Paris. And, by pursuing alliances with the Count of Saint-Paul, the heir to the Duchy of Bar, the city of Liège, and the Duke of Helders, Louis was able to tighten the noose. So by 1405, Louis was as strong as he had ever been, and was steadily eroding the Burgundian position. But as his power grew, so did his ambitions. In an unprecedented move, Louis convinced his brother to make him Duke of Normandy, something which had only been granted to the heirs of the throne since the duchy's seizure from King John of England. But there was a silver lining to the Burgundian exclusion from power. It allowed for John to present himself as a people's champion and a supporter of the public good, or public wheel if you prefer. John advocated against high taxes and the wasteful spending of the court. In doing this, he once more followed in the steps of his father. Philip the Bold had briefly taken up the banner of the public good, but had put it down in exchange for more control over the royal council. John was outspokenly opposed to a new tie championed by the Duke of Orléans in early 1405. This tax was meant to support the Duke's campaigns in Guienne, but was widely seen as just another way for him to line his pockets. John opposed the tax both in the royal council and in public, and stated that he would not allow it to be collected in his territories. After the tax was approved in the royal council, John made an appeal to the Parlement of Paris and the French Chambre des Comptes, and then left the capital in a huff. The Duke of Berry disapproved of his nephew's behavior, and wrote to Margaret of Flanders, saying, quote, He has been poorly advised. One can tell that he is new to his domains and has no experience of government. But while Barry considered John the Fearless's behavior to be embarrassing and immature, it was actually a calculated move which made him more popular than ever in Paris. Richard Vaughan even posits that the fact that John was absent from Paris for most of 1404 and early 1405 was intended to highlight his opposition to the high taxes. Not long after this tax was passed, Louis was in Normandy trying to make allies in the duchy and lay the groundwork for his assumption of it. However, the Norman acquisition was opposed both by the royal council and by the Norman nobility, and so when the Duke of Orléans was away from Paris, Charles was convinced to revoke the Norman grant. Furthermore, the king was convinced by others concerned with the public good to summon the major lords of France to Paris to discuss both the alienation of the royal domain through grants of land and the state of royal taxation. Both of these issues had been on people's minds due to the controversy with Louis' grant of Normandy and the widespread opposition to the recent tie. When the Duke of Orléans heard this, he panicked and rushed back to Paris in an effort to stop the meeting from taking place. But he was too late, and the messengers had already been sent out. On the other hand, when John heard of these summons, he knew that he had an opportunity to re-establish the Burgundian position at court. So when John the Fearless prepared to return to Paris, he resolved to do so in force. The timing was finally right for John the Fearless to make his grand entrance into the world of Parisian power politics. Louis of Orléans was now as unpopular as he had ever been, and the king's summons gave John a veil of legitimacy. But it is unlikely that the Duke of Burgundy intended to spark a civil war. Rather, like his father had done in 1401-1402, he likely wanted to force Louis of Orléans into royal arbitration using the threat of violence. John knew that his odds of success were far better if he appealed directly and personally to the king than if he made his case to the Orléans-dominated royal council. The central conflict between Orléans and Burgundy at this point had shifted from when Philip the Bold was alive. Louis and Philip had competed for control over the French state, and the total victory of one would have excluded the other. However, John the Fearless knew that he could not hope to totally gain control of France like his father had done but he still wanted a say in the government of the realm, and more importantly, a share of the revenues. On the other hand, Louis of Orléans saw his domination of the French royal council and the king as his birthright and refused to share power, especially with the son of the uncle who stood in his way for so many years. <laughs>
And so, as a prince of the blood and first peer of the realm, John the Fearless saw it as his right to have a share in the revenues and administration of France, well, as the brother of the king, Louis of Orléans saw it as his right to have total control over the revenues and administration. The Duke of Orléans worked to exclude all Burgundian influence from the royal council, while John fought to maintain and expand it. The Duke of Burgundy first went to Lequenois in Hainaut to meet with his brother Anthony, governor of Brabant, and his brother-in-law William, Count of Hainaut, Holland, and Zealand, where the three of them reaffirmed their alliance. From Lequenois, John made his way to Arras, where he had ordered his forces to gather. At this point, John maintained several garrisons meant to protect Artois and Flanders from an English invasion, and so he had a large pool of men to draw from. When he began his journey back to Paris in August of 1405, he did so with a company of over a thousand men-at-arms, and he would be followed shortly thereafter by his brother Anthony, leading another thousand men. When the Duke of Orléans heard that the Duke of Burgundy was on his way to Paris at the head of an army, he made plans to flee the capital. He had men of his own that could oppose John, but they would take time to assemble. Meanwhile, the king once more fell into a bout of madness. About two days before John was scheduled to arrive in Paris, the Duke of Orléans and Queen Isabeau announced that they would go hunting. After their day in the woods, rather than return to Paris, they made their way to the Queen's castle at Milan, about 50 kilometers or 30 miles south of the capital. Once at Milan, they sent summons to their supporters to meet them there and to bring the Dauphin with them. With the king no longer sane, John could, with his influence magnified by his popularity and military force, arrange for the Dauphin to assume power while his father was indisposed, and then make himself the guardian of the young prince. And even if this wasn't the case, control of the Dauphin still gave a measure of power and legitimacy. Isabeau and Louis were determined to prevent John the Fearless from gaining that ship, and so arranged to keep the prince in their custody. Meanwhile, the king was totally ignored in these preparations. Jonathan Sumption wrote, quote, He was hardly even a symbol now. Louis of Guienne was languishing in bed in the midst of an illness, but despite his doctor's objections, he was loaded into a litter and sent with his young wife, Margaret of Burgundy, to Melan, accompanied by his uncle Louis of Bavaria and other allies of the Queen and Orléans. John was about 15 miles from Paris when he learned of the kidnapping of the Dauphin, as this event has been passed into history as. But due to the poor weather at the time, he could not begin his pursuit immediately. The next morning, John the Fearless set off with a company of cavalry and riding as fast as they could, overtook the Dauphin's procession, about halfway between Paris and Milan. The Duke of Burgundy and his men quickly surrounded the company escorting the Dauphin and it was clear to all of them that they were overmatched. Louis of Bavaria was furious, but there was little that he could do. John then asked his young son-in-law if he preferred to continue to Milan or return to Paris, to which the Dauphin responded that he wanted to go home. And so John dismissed Louis of Bavaria and the rest of the Orleanist escort, and began the journey back to Paris with the crown prince in tow. Now there's something to be said about the fact that the name that has gone down in history for this event, the kidnapping of the Dauphin, refers to Isabeau summoning the Dauphin from Paris, rather than John returning the Dauphin to Paris. The fact that, as the mother and legal guardian of the Dauphin, Isabeau was legally completely in the right here, and John was in the wrong, tends to be overlooked. But at the time, John knew that despite his popularity, his legal position was shaky, and so made his case to an assembly of the nobility and notables from the church and towns of France. When the Duke of Orléans heard of John's interception of the Dauphin, he was furious and quickly penned a letter to the Parlement of Paris, accusing the Duke of Burgundy of high treason. John responded with his own version of the kidnapping. The Duke of Burgundy claimed that he was merely responding to a summons from the king and when he found out that the Dauphin had been taken from Paris without any notice to the other princes, he became concerned for the safety of the young prince, his son-in-law. His armed escort was merely there to protect himself from his enemies and to keep order in Paris. He then pivoted to promote his program of reform, and thus indirectly, and not so indirectly, attack Orléans and the Queen. John lamented about the high taxes that the people were paying and the wasteful spending dominating the court, ensuring that those taxes went to line the pockets of Orléans and his supporters rather than to attack the English. Not only that, but the royal domain was being carved up by those tasked with administering it, while the actual administration was left unattended to and royal justice had all but ceased to function. The king's plate and jewels had been pawned and royal officers worked against the king's interests. Admittedly, some of these claims are likely exaggerated, 
But the core of John's argument did ring true, and reform was needed to right the ship of state. However, Louis of Orléans responded to these arguments and claimed that these issues dated back to the death of Charles V, and thus that Philip the Bold and the other uncles were just as much, if not more, to blame as anyone else. And to be completely honest, Orléans had a pretty good point, and one that John couldn't refute without some heavy revisionism. The younger Duke of Burgundy claimed that his father hadn't purchased his lands like the Duke of Orléans had, and while he had received income from the crown, he more than made up for it in his services to it, and that on multiple occasions he had spent his own funds for the sake of the kingdom without royal repayment. Assertions which range from stretches of the truth to outright lies. Orléans and Burgundy now engaged in a war of public opinion, a realm where John had a distinct advantage. But the Duke of Burgundy was far less popular in the royal council than he was with the people of Paris. Further eroding the Burgundian position was the fact that John had no official position in the royal administration. Furthermore, the main organisms of that administration, the royal household, the Chambre des Comptes, the Paris Parlement, and the royal council, were all dominated by Orleanists, and those who were not full-on Orleanists still had a great deal of personal stake in the system as it was, and so were willing to stall and resist the Burgundian agenda of reform. To mollify the council and dispel fears that he was going to flee the capital with the Dauphin, John the Fearless handed the young prince over to his uncle, the Duke of Berry. John of Berry was then also made the Captain General of Paris, in hopes that he could stand between the Duke of Burgundy's force and the rapidly assembling troops of the Duke of Orléans. But the War of Words seemed to be rapidly approaching a war of arms. Both John the Fearless and Louis of Orléans received orders in the king's name telling them to dismiss their men but with each passing day, more still flocked to their banners. In mid-September, about a month since John first arrived in Paris, Louis decided to retake the capital. The Dukes of Anjou, Berry, and Bourbon had made several attempts to get Orléans and Burgundy to stand down, but neither were willing to compromise. The rivalry between the two dukes was even evident in their heraldry. Louis adopted the phrase, Je l'envie, or I desire it, as his motto, while John made the phrase, Ich haud, or I hold it, as his. Louis adopted a knotty branch as his emblem, while John took the carpenter plane as his own. Both dukes had gathered forces of about 5,000 men by this point. Louis's army included contingents led by the Count of Saint-Paul and the Duke of Lorraine, and John's included ones led by his brother, the governor of Brabant and son-in-law of the Count of Saint-Paul, and the Bishop of Liège. As the Orléanist army approached Paris, tensions within both camps increased. In Paris, John was losing his popularity as the people began to fear retributions from the Duke of Orléans in case of a Burgundian defeat, and his entreaties to the people of the city to defend it against Orléans were largely ignored. Meanwhile, the cost of maintaining almost 5,000 men was stretching his finances, which were still not being supplemented by the royal treasury. The Duke of Orléans had a great defensive position at Melan, and a store of money siphoned from previous ties there as well, but his issues were defined by logistics. He had the men, but those men had nothing to eat, so he was forced to plunder the Ile de France, further eroding his popularity. As the Orléanist army continued their march towards Paris, they needed to cross the Marne River to gather more provisions, but the town of Meaux, which guarded the river crossing, refused to allow Louis' army past. Fed up with his logistical issues and fearing that his army would desert or mutiny, Louis sent messengers to John to open negotiations. John was in almost as poor of a situation as Louis was. As the Duke of Orléans had begun to ravage the Ile de France, many of the people who lived in the smaller towns and rural communities began to flee to Paris, stretching the already stretched supplies in the capital. And, as John had not made preparations for a siege, he was glad to receive the out that these negotiations provided. As the king was still absent, these negotiations were led by the queen in her role defined by the earlier 1402 Ordonnance and facilitated by the Dukes of Anjou, Berry, and Bourbon. In these negotiations, John pressed for his reform agenda, while Louis pressed for the maintenance of his position. Like in the 1401-1402 conflict between Louis and Philip the Bold, in the end, a compromise was reached that didn't really solve anything. Louis's position wasn't assured or dismantled, and John received promises that his reforms would be considered, but nothing more than that was guaranteed. But most importantly, both dukes got the excuse to dismiss their forces and maintain their honor.
Orléans and Burgundy met on a bridge on the Seine, where they embraced each other as friends and entered into the capital together. However, while a military conflict had been avoided, tensions between Orléans and Burgundy had not been eased. Over the next few months, John's reforms were ignored, much to his dismay, and to the dismay of many others, such as the University of Paris. Furthermore, John's aggressive move had alienated some of the more neutral parties, such as the Duke of Berry, and drove him into the Orleanist camp. In early December, the Duke of Berry entered into a formal alliance with Queen Isabeau and Louis of Orléans, and shortly thereafter, the Duke of Bourbon joined them. And with the rest of the nobility turning against him, John saw that he had to make new allies. He invited the Constable of France and some other royal chamberlains to a dinner at the Hôtel d'Artois to try and get them on side and to gain their help in overcoming the opposition to his reforms. But Berry and Orléans sent their own messengers to these men, advising them not to attend. When John found out about this, he was furious, but there was little that he could do about it. He was becoming more marginalized by the day. But just as it looked like the Duke of Burgundy would have to cut his losses, the king regained his sanity. Seeing the state of things, Charles wanted to maintain order the next time he lost his sanity, and so reorganized and made official the arrangements for the government in his absence. These arrangements were largely the same as those made between 1402 and 1404. The queen was once more made the king's representative in his absence, and power over the royal council was given jointly to the dukes of Berry, Bourbon, Orléans, and Burgundy, importantly giving John an official named position in the government. And with the king lucid again, John found his position assured. He didn't have the same level of control over France as his father did, but he was now an integral part of the court. Some minor reforms began to be made, such as the reduction of grants to many of the princes, the revocation of many alienations of the royal domain, and many officers had their salaries reduced or outright cancelled. While in the show thus far, I've been focusing on royal grants given to the princes, Many people exploited Charles's illness to benefit from royal largesse, and many officers of the court had drawn disproportionately large salaries and received grants of land from the royal domain over the past few years. Charles saw this and had shown himself to be legitimately interested in reform in recent years whenever he regained his sanity, and so was amenable to John's entreaties on reform. However, I don't want to overstate the amount of change that occurred as it did not take long after this initial slashing of grants and gifts for them to start being handed out again. A bit selfishly, John was on the opposite side of this trend, as his income from the royal coffers rose from a trickle to a respectable yet not huge amount. Assurances were given that the crown's debts towards Philip the Bold would be paid, as well as the pensions promised to John in 1404. Furthermore, the Captain Generalcy of Picardy was taken from the Duke of Orléans and given to John so that he could have control over the royal forces in and around his territories. And so with the Duke of Burgundy gaining say in the court and the Duke of Orléans maintaining his dominance, an uneasy peace set in. Outwardly, the ducal cousins had reconciled and were often seen feasting together, but there was still a strong rivalry and dislike between the two which was noticeable to observers even at the time. And so we'll leave off here, with John having forced himself into the government of France and Louis looking for ways to exclude him once more. 1406 was a year of relative peace between the cousins, but a storm was brewing. But we won't get there for a bit. I'll be taking the next four weeks off, but I'll see you at the end of June for episode 23, Le Mort de Orléans. Thank you to my patrons. Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Kraft von Kravenstein, Anthony, Comte de Chateauneuf-Nuxois, James, Kraft von Temsa, and Preston, Comte de Saint Fargo. And thank you to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.